welcome to this special Christmas party friendly edition of Burning Platforms, um, the Centre for Responsible Technologies fortnightly deep dive into the politics of tech. My name is Peter Lewis, I'm the director of the centre and it's great to have all of you with us. I'm here on Gadigal land and I'm sure you will join me in paying respects to elders past, present, emerging, recognise the land we're all on was never ceded. We've got, I thought we'd be almost doing this as a little um, narrow cast today, guys, um, given that we sort of changed the time and it's the end of the year and everyone's Zoom fatigue, but it looks like we've got about 100 people in the room. So welcome, everybody. For those that haven't been here before, it's a bit like your normal Australia Institute webinar, except we do it as a meeting. So cameras are on, you're encouraged to use the chat, introduce yourself, ask questions as we go along. The format is that we um, have a bit of a chat about some of the key issues in tech in the first half hour, and then we do a deep dive into an issue in the second half hour. So my regular guests, um, sorry, my regular partners in crime panelists, um, Lizzie O'Shea, who's the chair of Digital White Swatch, Dan Stinton, who's the managing director of Garden, Guardian Australia, are both with us. Hi, guys. Wave or say hi. Morning, Pete. Um, I just got a plane coming over, so that adds to the quality of it. And our special guest today is Elaine Pearson from Human Rights Watch. And great to have you with us, Elaine, and thanks for your time. So, like I say, um, we spend the first half hour of these um, discussions with Liz, Lizzie, Dan, and I pulling out something that's caught our attention over the last um, fortnight and seeing, kicking it around the park and seeing if we can make sense of it. Um, I'm going to invoke um, Packer's privilege today and go first, um, mainly because the centre this week has put out this beautiful book, The Public Square Project, which is a series of essays thinking about the sorts of online spaces we want to be having into the future um, and where we are now and whether that's tenable. And um, both Dan and Lizzie were generous enough to um, contribute to this um, collection and we launched it in Canberra on Wednesday night with a terrific discussion um, at a politics in the pub event which should turn into um, its own webinar or not a webinar its own podcast at some point down the line but I thought that the, the issue that got me thinking how can I align my um, sort of self-interest with the broader discussion was a story that was um, published in the New York Times this week about Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse and what appears to be a property gold rush going on for private companies to go and buy property in this yet to be fully imagined space. So the setup is that Zuckerberg's rebranded Facebook as Meta. He said the future is going deeper into the internet through 3D glasses. It's probably Zoom on steroids. So instead of us all seeing our screens, we'll be sitting there with avatars he put on a concert a couple of weeks ago with Justin Bieber's avatar and everyone else was in an avatar in the crowd. Um, don't know how that would have gone down and whether it's really better than listening to a CD, but anyway. Um, but the idea that companies are already looking to buy property made me think, well, what about the rest of the space? Um, and one of the propositions in our book is that we need to not be reliant on a purely commercial model to create online spaces to manage our civil interactions and our civil society where we come together and work out our differences and come up with common truths and find a way forward. So given that in a way the focus of Public Square Project is really about the internet as it is now, thinking about how you make that work, it just struck me as interesting that the story is already moving on in a way and maybe it is just a, a wormhole with no end but there's also a whole lot of vested interests now that are really banking on this whole virtual environment um, becoming a reality. Um, so I don't know, it's blowing my mind a little bit to even try to, to, to define the question. And I guess maybe to start with you, Lizzie, what do you think, apart from is this total BS, the questions we should be asking as we watch this opening up of a new commercial space in the cyber world? Yeah, I mean, it is tempting to treat it as um, a load of BS. What I would say is, well, you know, for reasons that are obvious, I just, you know, I was reading the article, probably people saw that a yacht sold in as an NFT 
that I suppose can be used in the metaverse. I'm not even really sure what that means for $650,000. Um, and if you look at a picture of it, it looks like a Lego model. And I'm not really sure what the purpose of it is at all, except I guess a uh, kind of signal of status. Um, but clearly people are investing in this and it's a, a lot of smarter minds than mine who are more familiar with the space have all sorts of projections and um, ways of discussing why this works, why essentially you can create, I guess, a form of scarcity in a place that arguably has no limits, um, that gives things value uh, in the real world. But I have to say as well, a lot of that speculation feels to me a bit like uh, it could be as right as me saying that it's um, a complete bubble uh, that won't last. Uh, and so, you know, I'm happy to to be the person that says that in the event that it's true, because it feels just as likely as anything. I mean, of course, the thing that concerns me is the same thing I think that concerns you, Peter, that uh, if this is a kind of what, you know, in Marx's terms, or this is what Marx described it as in his writings at the time, as primitive accumulation, like where people go in and take things, you know, put their, their flag in the soil, you know, like they did in Australia, colonialists came here and claimed the land as a way of uh, expanding, you know, capitalist markets and the capacity to produce things and make money uh, in the marketplace. Um, is this another example of that in a 21st century setting? Um, and if that's the case, what is left for the public and do, does the public need to have a space that belongs to them that everyone can participate in that isn't owned can we stop that uh, drive to accumulate before we've had a chance to discuss what ought to be demarcated and available for everyone to participate and enjoy rather than just individuals who've, who've bought stuff and have money to do so I, I find it difficult to tell because of course if there's if it's limitless um resource, maybe just the answer is that public institutions should be claiming space for that purpose. They don't necessarily have to buy it. But in the metaverse, we do create um, places in which people can participate in public life. There is a whole, um, I think probably the way to think about it is in terms of layers. And we've had a discussion here previously uh, with um, Michaela uh, from who, who works in VR. And she talked about how, I guess, the, the metaverse as well in terms of virtual reality is multiple layers. And it's not just the space itself. It's also how you access it through headsets and the like. And that Facebook is, or Meta is interested in trying to control those different layers of the metaverse. And that's probably, I think, where the discussion might need to be had, not necessarily around does the public need to have its own real estate in the metaverse, but also how the metaverse is structured and how our access points will be controlled by private corporations, that those different layers of it are just as important. That's probably the, the way I'd like to try and make sense of it, or I feel that we will. In, be, in a um, way, it's like the Wild West, except the Wild West is already owned by a global corporation, and then other people are buying bits of the global corporation's Wild West. So there is no openness yeah. about it from day Perhaps one. It's like Westworld, uh, in fact, Peter. Oh, one of my favourites. Dan, what's your take? Um, oh, probably similar to, to Lizzie in a way. I mean, this, this feels skeuomorphic to me. And what, what I mean by that is it, it feels like we're, we're applying the, the sort of the, the, the offline world ideas to, uh, you know, an online world, world or the metaverse, whatever you want to call it, where it doesn't really belong. It sort of reminds me of, of like early films, which were effectively just a camera filming a bunch of people on a stage like a play. And it took, took about a decade or so before we realised that we could actually have close-ups and, and utilise the, the craft. I mean, one of the, one of the benefits of, um, of digital and, and online um, spaces is that they are effectively infinite. You can have, you know, uh, an infinite number of people, uh, in theory at least, um, able to consume uh, content and, and the like. And so having property rights per se on a particular place just seems, I don't know. I mean, I, I do think there is, um, and we're going to get into this in the next topic, I do think there is a huge amount of benefit that comes or innovation that will come off the back of having property rights in uh, digital spaces. And, and we'll get to that. But this one just feels like buying up space in the metaverse, just when you can right click and create another one just feels uh, feels a little bit silly. And, and the if I'm wrong, though, let, let's say that I'm wrong, and I've been wrong about many things before, so I probably am here as well, but let's say I'm wrong, and this is actually a, a new gold rush or, or a new property land rush, and, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm missing out. I guess the, the question I've got is, again, probably another uh, poor analogy. At the moment, we're going through a process of, um, rather frustrating process, I've got to say, of, of considering renovating our house and negotiating with the council Who's the council in the metaverse? Who who is the responsible for for um, making sure that what gets built is appropriate and fair for everybody that's 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 in there? And I just yeah. once again, it probably echoes Lizzie's point. It, it goes to private companies for making their own rules here, which which well, that, is that we've, we've seen be, how that worked out. 
that might be a question for Elaine. Like we're talking about property rights in the metaverse. Would there be human rights? Have you? I, I, I'm just throwing it out at you. I don't expect you to have sort of gone too deep down this wormhole. I mean, I, to be honest, I'm still struggling to understand exactly what the metaverse is. I mean, I think. We all are. I think for me, I guess the way that I had conceived it with the property rights is, isn't this just really about like advertising? And so companies wanting to get in to sort of be on the ground, sort of advertise their spaces in the same way that I guess with the internet, there was this rush to like secure certain domain names. So, you know, for instance, whenever I try and go to the Guardian page, you know, I always end up at this other Guardian web page, which is also a news blog, but it's not the Guardian Australia because someone's obviously bought that domain. And so I just wonder if the same thing is happening now with the metaverse, like there are advertisers thinking, oh, I need to get in there because I need to sort of claim my stake in the ground. Um, but of from course, the human rights different... perspective, I don't, I don't know that there's necessarily like, yeah, mm. certainly something that we haven't thought about at yeah. Human Rights Watch. Well, the other part of it is that this may just be a vehicle to find some value in cryptocurrency. I know, Dan, your chosen topic is Jack Dorsey's pivot from Twitter to Square, which is his big, um, you know, cryptocurrency play. Um, and in the metaverse, I, the idea is you'll have, it'll be sovereignless. And so you can create your own currency and your own deal. So do you want to step us through, I know you've had a degree of enthusiasm around some of this thinking. So I'm actually interested in, in, in getting the vibe off you on, on what's going on there. I think the vibe is about all I can give you at this point, but I'll, I'll give it a crack. I, I can I can feel um, or anticipate Lizzie's eyes rolling from the other side of the continent already as I as I get into uh, get into this. But um, <laughs> well, uh, I'll do it all the same. So yeah, I mean, look, this is I guess an evolution of of where we started, and that's um, there's just been a flurry of activity in so called Web 3.0, which is effectively um, you know an evolution of the internet, if you like, which is based on blockchain technology. You know, we've had Jack Dorsey. I think I'm going to read you one of his quotes that he said recently. He said uh, on 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 Bitcoin in particular, he said, I don't think there's anything more important in my lifetime to work on. And I don't think there's anything more enabling for people around the world. I mean, shoot me, it's Jack getting a bit carried away. But um, that said, I think it is true to say that there's a huge amount of um, innovation, new companies being created, which are based on blockchain tech. And I think this is just uh, one more example of it. It follows, you know, a bunch of investors creating a, a DAO, a, a so-called decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, they attempted to buy a copy of the US Constitution, which is a real physical asset, but for the purposes of creating uh, an NFT, uh, an electronic version of it, if you like, which is going to be worth something. For what it's worth, they were outbids, so they weren't successful, but it was it was interesting all the same. And in my world, it also follows um, something that we spoke about in this forum, I think about a year ago, and it's a bunch of the of large publishers are experimenting with the, the NFT space as well. So you've had the New York Times selling off an original version of an article uh, for about 500,000 US, I think it was. The Economist has done something similar with uh, with their front covers. Uh, CNN has also been experimenting in this space. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, I'm starting to believe, probably much later than I should have, to be honest, I'm starting to believe that this is something which is going to be um, quite transformative, but not in the property rights way where we discussed. I think there's there's probably three things to consider here. And that's that, you know, Web 3.0, it's all about creating unique digital assets on the blockchain that can't be copied. So that's, that's something new, I guess, where we started is, you know, the internet is effectively one right click away from, from uh, having something that is infinite. Whereas what blockchain does, it allows you to create a, a unique asset. And that enables things like, cryptocurrencies like uh, like um, Bitcoin. Um, it brings property rights to the internet for the first time, for better or worse. I think we've touched on that. Um, and I guess, I, I'm a, I, I actually want to hear what Lizzie's take on this is, but we sort of covered it to some extent. I mean, if we're bringing property rights to the internet, what are the, some, of, some of the things that we have to be considering here? Because what I'm, what I'm conscious of is that we're probably going to end up in a space which is, if we're not careful, where there's a few large tech players based out of Silicon Valley or, or increasingly China, which are going to dominate it, and that could be a, a pretty concerning space to be. Um, so this probably deserves its whole, its whole, a whole show on its own with experts far smarter than me to talk about it. But um, anyway, I think it's interesting to note just how much this is this is coming along and how much 3.0 is becoming mainstream in, in particularly in the last month or so. I did just want to post that article about the constitution. DAO to talk about how that happened and how it unfolded because I think it is an interesting example actually of how things can go wildly wrong as well because in essence what they were doing was trying to purchase a physical copy of the constitution they got outbid and then the question becomes well what do you do with the funds that you've raised 
uh, for that purpose if you no longer have uh, the opportunity to execute on, to operationalize it. And I do think it's really interesting because you can read through it and see how the people who um, essentially were trying to put together that, that project changed tack a couple of times and how frustration, frustrating it probably was for anyone who was investing in it and how you lose a huge amount of money in what's called gas fees. So when you're changing your money in and out of a cryptocurrency, there's costs associated with that because it's not a liquid asset. It's not actually like cash. You do have to pay um, to move it around and, and that creates friction, but it also means that the money is, or the, or the value is not the same as, as cash, obviously, even though often it's kind of talked about in that way. And I think what it really brought home for me is that uh, so often in these um, discussions, we talk about this as being a kind of limitless space with very few rules, but ultimately people are controlling these organisations. And in relation to that project, they did have significant power in how quite a lot of money um, was accumulated and then now maybe used for something entirely different to what was originally intended. Uh, and that I think is interesting because there's this view that blockchain creates this security, this transparency, because the rules have to be followed uh, and it's there for everybody to see. But actually humans can have a huge impact in how that might unfold, especially in unexpected circumstances. And in this instance, we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. And who loses in that context? It feels to me a little bit like a scam. I'm not sure it intended to be like that, but the outcome looks very similar to that. And I think that's something that people need to keep in mind. I think there's lots of really savvy people who are perhaps in this space and are a step ahead of others. And there may be very significant consequences for people who aren't as savvy. The other kind of point that comes to mind when I hear people talk about these this kind of infrastructure is that it, there's this constant emphasis on how essentially it's free from the rules of uh, governments, of sovereign states, that there's a, a sense that it's largely lawless, that part of the appeal, and I don't mean that in a um, moralistic sense, I mean it in the sense that gives people the freedom to do what they want without having to rely on a sovereign government to enforce these rights because they are on a computing system. They're not, um, they're not backed up by assets like a government would normally for a currency. And to my mind, that also seems quite naive because at the end of the day, I think um, capitalists in this space or people, speculators and the like, will end up having to rely on resources that exist among sovereign states to perhaps enforce their rights. Like you can see how the constitution dare and might end up in litigation, for example, uh, and that we, we depend obviously on the infrastructure of the web and computing to be able to keep um, blockchains running, to make them, uh, you know, sustainable. And I do wonder whether that's really something that anyone has grappled with philosophically in the space that I can see. Um, it's really easy, obviously, to be dismissive and cynical about it. And it's really easy to be like Jack Dorsey and overly optimistic about its potential. Uh, but I think probably we need political philosophers, you know, historians, this is, this is my kind of pitch, I suppose, generally, to make sense of this. And I think there's too much emphasis on it being a space that's absent from meat space, so to speak, in terms of its enforceability and rules, when in fact, I think in reality, lots of people will end up having to rely on sovereign states to enforce their rights, to um, back up their assets. And that's going to be a tension because to what extent does the public want to want to do that subsidising of people speculating in cryptocurrencies and in online spaces? I, I'm not sure that that is sustainable. Particularly assuming it's going to be in an environment where it's really hard to, you know, have tax. Um, so there won't be any extraction back to the community from these commercial activities. Um, I... I, I love your point, Lizzie, that it's not about saying it's rubbish or it's brilliant. It's saying, well, if it is um, going to happen, what are the guardrails and the red lines we should be thinking through as it develops? A bit like the way we're talking about the development of AI and the facial recognition technology. Like this should not be going on um, as a market play because it's a social play or potentially one that really undermines a lot of um, the norms that we've put in place in the real world. So I don't know if you want to round that off, Dan. I, I, it does feel like a discussion for a, a full um, burning platforms, but it's been a great little teaser here. Yeah, we probably need to get um, get into this in a bit more detail at a, at a future um, future date next year. I mean, I guess just one last point on this. I, I am conscious of um, if you if you look at Web 2.0, uh, if you like where we are now, you know, one of the best things about the internet is that everyone can be a publisher. And one of the worst things about the internet is that anyone can be a publisher. And we've seen the, the sort of downside of not having gatekeepers, if you like, controlling information, uh, as well as lots of upside, clearly. 
I, I do worry about this, um, uh, the vibe of it more than anything else, um, but I do worry about this in the sense that it's so much of blockchain is built on the concept of decentralization and not having uh, and a sort of central point of oversight. And obviously that comes with a huge amount of benefits. Um, and it, you know, it does feel in some ways like it could be, you know, uh, similar to the early web where it's built on standard protocols and of, of openness. And, and that's a really good thing. But I also worry that without that oversight, are we rushing once again, rushing into this huge new technology without considering the implications of, of what it could be of not having anyone sort of overseeing it. So, uh, anyway, let's, let's dive into this in more detail in a, in a, in a future podcast, but yeah, good on you. Um, the final um, issue that we'll deal with in the early days, and I'll let you open the um, bowling on this one, Lizzie, is the um, anti-trolling laws that um, have been introduced amidst much fanfare in the federal parliament. I think it, that I think by design there would have been more fanfare. I think that Morrison was really planning on making this his big G20 thing as well, but it kind of got got caught up with um, his um, showdown with the French. But this is um, this is obviously a, a big play by the federal government. What's your take on it? Yeah, so people may have read about this, but there's a uh, public exposure draft of this piece of legislation talking about, or essentially is aimed, or the way it's discussed is unmasking trolls online. I think that's probably a bit of a misdirection. Uh, what the legislation does is it essentially um, removes liability for media companies who may have comments being published on their page on a platform like Facebook. So people might recall the Vola decision in which media companies were held liable for comments that um, may be defamatory uh, posted on a social media platform. Um, and what that does then is puts it onto social media platforms to be liable instead of media companies. And then what it does is it creates an incentive for those social media platforms to keep a register of the contact details of every user so that uh, to avoid liability themselves, they can point uh, a defamation plaintiff to the individual poster themselves. So it creates a mechanism for people to be able to access the details of somebody who's posting online through a social media platform uh, so that someone can sue them in, in defamation. So it's really a, a proposal that's designed to give more rights to defamation plaintiffs, which I think it's fair to say Australia sits probably um, at one end of the spectrum when it comes to defamation uh, and its potential to be misused by those in power, in my view. I think we definitely need to reform defamation laws for that reason. Uh, most recently, of course, quite famously, Peter Dutton sued um, a refugee activist who tweeted about him uh, and since deleted it and was successful and has been awarded damages. Uh, so defamation is used by the powerful. The obvious other example is Christian Porter suing the ABC, of course. Um, so to my mind, this is, uh, the discussion is about uh, online trolls and anonymous accounts, but in reality, it's about giving rights to, to people seeking to sue in defamation. My take, I suppose, is that if you look at the research, it's quite limited, but there is a bit out there. And I think this is something we could research more, uh, and it would be of great utility, is that anonymity isn't necessarily the driver of online abuse uh, or um, removing anonymity doesn't necessarily correlate with a decrease in cyberbullying. And we know that from a little bit of research that exists out there, and um, this may be also the subject of a, a future episode. But I, I think that we can put a lot of emphasis on anonymous trolls and then leave intact perhaps a broader discussion of how these spaces are, are not nice and how cyberbullying occurs. The government, in my mind, sees this as a really surefire vote winner. I think there's a lot of uh, public support for holding social media platforms to account for improving those spaces. I think it sees it as, uh, as being uh, an opportunity to lead on this globally and look like they're being very assertive and introduce legislation. There's also an inquiry now that they've announced that will report back in February, uh, which times very well for them in terms of the election. I don't actually think that's very cynical. I think it's pretty obvious to many people. You know, they're very happy to legislate in this field. We've also had the Online Safety Act, Act which introduced very broad ranging powers for this kind of purpose. And yet they can't seem to get their act together to legislate for an integrity commission at a federal level. I think they've got a huge appetite to do this because it suits them politically. And my worry is that we will create a system for identifying um, users of social media and we'll discard the right to anonymity, which has some in incredible value in a democracy. And really, we need to have that discussion before we just proceed down this path and frame it solely about trolling, which I don't think it really is about. And part of the um, small print of this was also that the um, uh, 
the liability that appeared to be building on media companies as a result of the High Court Vola case would no longer be applied to the media companies. So I guess you guys had a bit of a skin in the game in this, but what was your take on what came out the other end? Yeah, so look, we are supportive of this, um, but before I get into the reasons why, I mean, I do want to acknowledge some of the points that Lizzie made because I think I agree with most of them. Um, and that is, I mean, look, it's called the, the anti-trolling bill. I think that is actually a misleading title. It's, it's actually not about anti-trolling at all. It's really a defamation bill. Um, and it's a in a fairly narrow way. I, I also agree that Australia has some of the... Uh, the strictest defamation uh, regulation in the world, and that, that needs to change massively. But in this circumstance, the reason we're supportive of it is, is for two reasons. So firstly, I think it cleans up the mess that follows the Vola decision. Now, notwithstanding the appalling treatment of Vola, I'm, I'm not in any way um, wanting to defend that. But I just make the point that uh, we discussed this a few weeks ago, three media companies were held liable for uh, comments that users made on their Facebook pages about, uh, about Vola, where they had exactly zero control over the ability to turn those comments off. Um, so it cleans up that mess, if you like, and makes it clear that the people who are responsible for um, potentially defamatory comments are those that are making it and not you know, the media companies which might be, be using these platforms. The second reason that we're supportive of it is um, a perhaps more, a more nuanced one, but we talked about this again a couple of weeks ago. I, I am supportive of the idea that uh, while, I, while acknowledging the benefits of anonymous uh, anonymity, anonymity online, I am supportive of the idea that the platforms at least have to know who is commenting on their platform. Um, not because I think this is necessarily going to make a huge difference to um, uh, defamation, but just because I think this is a step in the right direction to forcing uh, the large social media platforms to take their responsibilities seriously of knowing who's on their platform. And if this is if this is some way of mitigating the use of fake accounts for what is trolling or potentially spreading of misinformation, disinformation, particularly during election cycles, of which we've got one coming up in, in May, most likely, then I'm supportive of it. So for those two reasons, I think this is for the good. I just think it's it's part of, wrapped up in part of a, mm. uh, an agenda of bashing the platforms, and that's unfortunate because it's it takes away from the benefit of what what this legislation mm. is actually uh, achieving. Yeah, I, I'm slightly different in that I'm all for bashing the platforms, and I think a notion of platform accountability, not so much. And look, I take Lizzie's point on the legal and whether the laws are workable. I will not try to have a legal debate with you anytime because I know who's going to win that, but. I guess my point would be that it's that the business model of driving the the anger that creates the engagement. There's a there's a real um, momentum that's created by networks of anonymous accounts. And if this legislation can actually disrupt that model and and, and force platforms to be more curious about where their accounts are coming from, I see that as being quite transformative. So. I put a piece up as well, which I'll put in the chat. I won't use our time to repeat those arguments, but Lizzie, you did, this is your topic and I will offer you a right of reply on anonymity. Yeah, I just wanted to make the case for anonymity because I think there are, is some really important arguments around why people elect to be online in an anonymous way. Um, most obviously it facilitates de de dissent and the capacity of whistleblowers to be able to communicate with journalists. Those kinds of things are quite important. You know, if you're a public servant, you're probably subject to pretty rigorous HR requirements that avoid you being able to really meaningfully participate in online life. And, you know, that's the kind of baby I think you throw out with the bathwater. I also saw a really interesting article recently about a doctor who was supportive of trans rights, who is essentially censured by the professional body for tweets that he'd made. And you can see how someone even like a doctor who's um, you know, participating in online spaces on controversial topics, in, on, including things like trans rights, might wish to do that anonymously for professional reasons too. Uh, the other component, of course, is that there's many young people who wish to explore their identity in online spaces that might not be living in a safe environment, that might not have supportive parents. And you can see how a scheme like this that requires that social media platforms hold contact details of users may end up being used in 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 quite uh, exploitative ways you know including to protect children supposedly by giving parents access to this information in ways that might actually cause harm but isn't that an argument to come up with a, a model where that data is held somewhere safe rather than allowing the status quo like my only concern with where you end up is that it kind of endorses status quo 
Oh, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think there's a real appetite for change around how, for example, elections are monitored and, and social media spaces are used. I think that privacy reform, for example, which is just sitting out there, you know, the government has not actioned this or progressed it in the way that I would have liked, even though it's been discussed as being a, a field that requires extensive reform. Privacy reform is one. There's lots of different ways in which, you know, and, and obviously that includes the use of political organisations using social media. There's lots of ways in which we could start to regulate for those kinds of problems rather than seeking an, uh, an end to anonymity as a way to serve them in perhaps a secondary way. So let's look at the harms that are being caused. Let's look at the problems in online spaces and then let's devise a solution. I'm not for accepting the terms that have been put forward in this debate by Scott Morrison. I think it's a bit dangerous to do so. Absolutely. Dan, I'm going to hand the, the, the floor to you to introduce our special guest, Elan, and sort of <coughs> kick off the debate on broader human rights in the digital realm. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, as mentioned at the start, our special guest this week is Elaine Pearson, who is the Australian Director at Human Rights Watch. Um, so, Elaine, you've been writing on um, a, a lot of topics in this space recently, but before we dive into that, I, I mean, I did want to just, if, I, if we could, get your take on this last topic that we've been discussing, because obviously there are, uh, I would assume, some human rights implications for from this bill. Can, can you give a, do you, do you have an opinion? Yeah, I think I'm largely with, you know, Lizzie here in this discussion. I mean, I think anonymity really is an important thing to protect. And I think, you know, we want to make sure that measures taken are necessary and proportionate. And I don't know that, you know, making it easier to sue people for online defamation is a good enough reason to insist, you know, on, you know, these, these broad-based reforms. I mean, I'm actually quite worried that other countries, you know, potentially might look at what Australia does and then use it you know, in a way to go after, you know, for instance, dissidents who might have, um, you know, a different identity online. We've already seen that happen, you know, where um, Chinese authorities question people about, you know, the Twitter accounts they've opened in Australia and people have thought that they've done it under a pseudonym thinking that they're safe. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I am worried that if the platforms have that power of like, you know, collecting vast amounts of information that that potentially could be used in a way by other governments to really sort of silence um, criticism and dissent that they don't like. So, mm. you know, I think, and I also think that, you know, I mean, a lot of those online defamation cases, like the one that um, Lizzie mentioned with uh, Peter Dutton and Shane Bazzi, I mean, Shane Bazzi made those comments in his own name. You know, he wasn't hiding um, anonymously online. And I think in many of the cases, it's that. So, you know, I also think the rich and powerful, like, you know, particularly people who are in the public eye, like our politicians, they have to have a bit of a thicker skin about these things. And I think Peter Dutton's actually drawn way more attention to those remarks um, by suing Shane Bazzi than if, you know, Shane had have just, you know, written that tweet and been done with it. Mm. Which is a nice uh, segue, actually. I mean, the, you wrote a piece uh, which is touches on a lot of these themes, which we discussed a few weeks back on on India and um, how some some really disturbing developments, if you like, of how India is doing exactly um, or similar things to what we've been discussing here and in, in, in utilising uh, identity, if you like, to, to stifle debate and criticism amongst other things. Do you, do you want to give us a sense, Elaine, on what what some of the things that could go wrong here? What what India uh, is doing in, in, in order to uh, effectively abuse human rights in, in, in their country? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting to have Narendra Modi uh, speaking at the Sydney Dialogue a couple of weeks ago. And I think, you know, he talked about, you know, the importance of openness of the internet, um, when in reality, actually, India is the country that has more internet shutdowns than anywhere in the world. And, you know, that's largely in Kashmir, but it's also been to respond to you know, the farmers' protests, and this has really important human rights implications in terms of stopping people's ability to organize, communicate, you know, seek information, but also it has economic consequences. I mean, these internet shutdowns has cost the Indian economy billions of dollars. Um, and that's just, you know, one example. I mean, there's also been these new IT rules um, that have been introduced in India and they compel social media companies, digital news sites um, the, and, and others to, uh, restrict certain content. So in a way that really encourages self-censorship. Um, also what we were talking about earlier with Australia, in India, um, these new IT rules also require traceability of information. And so, you know, the concern there is that that will really weaken end-to-end -end encryption on platforms like WhatsApp or Signal. And I think this is really worrying for India, but I think it's also worrying for the world because, you know, other governments see the Indian government doing that and then they think they can do the same. 
Um, the other requirements are things like requiring sort of in-country staff. And this has sometimes been referred to as like the hostage taking rule. So, you know, you have instances where the Twitter staff in country have been threatened with arrest and fines and potentially even jail terms, but not shutting down certain accounts um, that have been critical of the government. Now, they did shut down the accounts that they determined were, you know, inciting hate speech or inciting violence. But there were other accounts that they thought, you know, were legitimately, you know, raising concerns, criticisms of the government's response to certain things, and they didn't shut down those accounts. So I think that's also really worrying. And this is really all part of a broader crackdown in India, which is targeting, you know, journalists, activists, minorities. And I think, yeah, technology is just being used as a, as a tool in, in that repression. And, and there course, are some... So can I just, you just on that, um, so the context of that, um, Sydney dialogue was really the quad, right? Um, yeah. And Japan, India, Australia, and the US as this security alliance. And almost, it seemed to me almost it was shifting from the military industrial complex to the tech industrial complex. What do you think the risks for Australia in enmeshing technical alliances with a, a country like India that's using tech like this would be? Yeah, I mean, that was totally the purpose of the Sydney Dialogue. And I think, it, you know, India and Australia have signed this, you know, new cyber agreement. You know, I think Australia really sees India as an important market, um, especially given the problems now with, with China. But I think, you know, if that's going to happen, then there also needs to be concerns raised about these human rights consequences. Because otherwise, if Australia is just sort of turning a blind eye and basically giving Modi a platform to speak, about all the wonderful things that you know India is doing in terms of digital technology, and obviously there have been successes, then you know we're not actually addressing the problems, and you know things are actually getting worse in India, particularly for civil society um, in terms of restrictions on funding, and you know even journalists and bloggers getting caught up in a lot of these acts. So I think you know what we would like to see the Australian government doing is. You know, if you're going to give Modi a platform like that, well, at least the least you can do is ensure that civil society activists also from India have an opportunity to raise these concerns and talk about the way that, you know, we can introduce safeguards to prevent these very sort of harmful impacts from occurring. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, just picking up on one of the points you made of, of requiring these companies to have local offices. I mean, I do, I do note that uh, this so-called anti-trolling legislation also, one of the requirements is that uh, any company uh, overseas which has an Australian audience of over 250,000, I think, is required to have an Australian office um, mm -hmm. effectively to make it easier for this defamation process to carry through. So I, uh, I do acknowledge there are some parallels, some disturbing parallels, actually, with what is, what is going on with India. Can I ask uh, a well, question, let's... Elaine? Do you mind? Mm. I, I just wanted, I, I did participate in an online <clears throat> debate um, on what was the equivalent of probably Sky News in India, uh, which was pr mm -hmm. pretty full on. Um, but we were talking about social media platform regulation and there were some people from the government there. And I think they misunderstood that I was Australian. I think they thought I was American, but they really did um, object to me talking about human rights in that context, because the pitch that they were putting is, we don't want you Americans coming here and telling us about human rights. You've created these awful online platforms. We have a right to be able to determine them, uh, how they look, you know, without your patronising ideas of human rights. Now, of course, it wasn't quite put like that. There's certainly that kind of vibe to how these discussions unfold and really playing into, you know, a nationalist idea of what India is as well, which has obviously been so central to Modi's uh, ascendancy politically. How do you feel that works when you're advocating for human rights in online spaces, which I think is a very legitimate thing to do, of course, um, personally, but in a context in which that kind of hostility is um, really easily able to be pushed and, and plays in really neatly with some of these um, nationalist ideas? Do you find that you get a lot of pushback on this kind of stuff? I mean, a lot of governments will say that to us, you know, you're an outsider, how could you possibly understand? And I mean, I think the answer to that is, you know, I mean, we... We, Human Rights Watch is not full of, you know, Australian and, and American staff. We have, you know, Indian staff as well. And I think the reality is it's actually now become very, very difficult for local civil society to raise a lot of these concerns precisely because of the restrictions um, that have been imposed. So, you know, I think it's about holding, you know, all governments to the same standards. And I think, you know, my response is often, you know, look at the criticisms that we also make of the Australian government. And, you know, India's democracy it should be open to, to criticism and you know we certainly also address a lot of those concerns to the corporations and to social media companies that have responsibilities so I think you know we're going to hold everyone um, to the same standards and you know we're not going to be shy to call it out you know simply because you know we're not from that country.
What about what about the platforms, Elaine? So uh, you also published an article uh, recently, Human Rights Watch, that is on um, what the Israeli government is doing uh, to Palestinians utilizing technology over there, and it, and largely from what we can gather with with the help of Facebook itself in, in aggressively taking down content which the Israeli government probably doesn't like. Um, is it is there a role? I mean, I think there is, but what, what do you think the role is of of these large platforms, in particular Facebook, on in in participating in these sorts of things from government. Yeah, so I mean, just to explain, so during the recent May hostilities in Gaza, um, Facebook actually was wrongfully removing and suppressing content um, on human rights abuses that was being shared by Palestinians and their supporters. So we did a bit of an investigation, you know, looking at this. And I mean, I think it's kind of interesting because obviously there's a lot of discussion now about Facebook not doing enough to respond to hate speech, not doing enough to clean up toxic discussions that can have quite deadly you know, consequences in places like Myanmar. Um, but you know, this is a case actually of, of overreach. And I think you know, obviously the, the platforms have been struggling for a while, how to prevent you know, misinformation and hate speech from proliferating. They've been you know, trying to hire more people who speak local languages to do the content moderation. But I think, you know, it raises this question of, well, what do you do if you hire people who also have inherent biases and mm. those biases are then reflected in how they're moderating the content? So I think you need to continually monitor for that. And, you know, with Facebook, they have this oversight board and the oversight board actually recommended that there was an independent investigation into um, content moderation during that, that period. Um, but, you know, with all of these things, these oversight, you know, the oversight board has been set up, but, you know, there's no obligation on Facebook to actually implement its recommendations. Mm. Um, so yeah, still lots to do. Yeah, I mean, nothing's gonna get in the way of um, Facebook's profits, I don't think, I think they've demonstrated that. I mean, what, what's really interesting on this point though, is that, um, and again, we've, we've touched on this many times in this forum before, but um, what was uh, quite, um, well, perhaps not surprising, but a, a, an interesting revelation is that Facebook spends a huge amount of time on moder and expense on moderation in the US. Uh, particularly in the last election, but they spend virtually nothing on overseas territories. And we've seen the consequences of that in Myanmar. And perhaps on the other side, the consequences of perhaps not having enough moderators in countries like uh, Israel, where um, that having enough people that are going to understand the nuance and uh, the debate is, is something which you know, requires a huge amount of resources. I mean, it's effectively the, the, the role of a publisher. And once again, they're not taking that, that responsibility seriously. Can I throw in there also just back to anonymity? The Facebook whistleblower before the last Facebook whistleblower, Sophie Zhang, um, raised this concern that I still hasn't been addressed of how in... Um, democracy challenged um, countries, the ecosystems of fake accounts are actually used to entrench power by government. And I think it's, it, I'm not trying to win the last point of the argument. I'm just interested if what, what is a credible solution to winding back the effective freedom of states to use the platforms as tools of co coercive control? But are, are these two slightly different problems? Because what you're talking about is widespread, in somewhere like Myanmar, widespread use by the government and the military of social spaces to essentially prosecute a political agenda, which arguably resulted in people mm. dying in genocidal tendencies, mm. as opposed to identifying individuals who oh, yes. used not, the I'm cover of anonymity. I'm not trying to pull the two together, but I'm saying that it, what is the solution to that one where um, the ecosystem of anonymous accounts, create, according to this whistleblower, creates the momentum to actually distribute and embed that information into those communities. I think it's a very wicked problem. And I think in addition to what you were talking about, Dan, I don't think it's just a problem of resources and money. It's also the bargain that they make in offering the service in particular countries. I mean, often we talk about this in relation to China, but this is an example of a supposed democracy, Israel, wow, that professed to be a democracy, engaging in exactly the same kind of behaviour, using social media platforms as a proxy to crack down on dissent and to sanitise these online social spaces in ways that suit their agenda. The question I think that, yeah, I think that we need to come to terms with is, 
we like to think these platforms will apply the rules in the US around freedom of expression and stuff in other places, but they clearly don't for business reasons. And I don't think that's a matter of resourcing or under-resourcing disinformation and content moderation around that question. I think it's around their political decision to enter that market and then take that Faustian bargain of then doing the government's bidding in order to stay. And uh, yeah, I suppose the point is that a lot of fear-mongering happens in respect of this around China and then democracies differentiate themselves from authoritarian regimes in China, but there's there are other places where this occurs and Israel's a prime example. I'm not sure there's easy solutions to it, but I think there's a couple of reasons why. It's not just resourcing, it's also the political context in which they operate. Yeah, China almost gives all these democracies a leave pass because what they're doing yeah. is so much more extreme that, um, that that places like Israel perhaps get away with it, which which is a nice segue actually uh, back to you, Elaine. So what I, what about China? I mean, I I, I know that you've um, Human Rights Watch that is has published a a series of articles really on some of the abuses going on in China and their use of technology, particularly with regards to surveillance. Can you can you give us a sense of of what's going on there? Yeah, so I mean, one of the reports that we did um, focused on a surveillance app that is used by the police um, in Xinjiang in China, um, really to monitor the movements of Uyghurs. So this is an app that we reverse engineered, and basically it collects information about where you go, what websites you use, who you're meeting with, you know, what apps you have on your phone, how much data you're using, um, whether you have VPNs or you know, if you have the presence of WhatsApp or Signal, you, know, you might be using those things to communicate you know, with people outside the country. All of these things can be grounds for suspicious behavior. And if you are deemed to be someone who is you know, potentially you know, threatening to, to the state, then on the basis of that information that's collected, you can be sent to political re-education camps. So, you know, I think this is really concerning. You know, obviously there's been a lot of information about what happens inside the camps, but it also means because there is this mass surveillance state, you know, that is um, prepared in, in Xinjiang, you have people modifying their behavior in order to avoid detection. So, you know, it might be just very basic things like, you know, instead of speaking Uyghur, you're gonna say ni hao, you know, in Mandarin when you speak to your colleagues. You might not wanna to go to the mosque. You might not wanna grow a beard if you're a man. You might not wanna wear a headscarf if you're a woman because you're trying to evade the attention of authorities. Um, and so I think, you know, the fact that surveillance has become really this daily tool of repression, it almost becomes like, well, you don't even really need the camps anymore. You have the threat of the camps there, um, but actually it's been quite an effective way of you know, really changing people's behavior and changing how people interact with, with one another to the point where you know, they're just not even talking about things that they know might be considered politically sensitive. I mean, it's, it's not a stretch to draw parallels with 1984 here, is it? I mean, it is, it is when, when there is that much surveillance ongoing in China and from what we can gather, it just seems to be accelerating rather than the other way around. And particularly with the use of, of facial recognition so, um, technology, which I know Lizzie has talked about a lot and has uh, lots of concerns with, and I, share, I think I share all of them. Um, what, what's your take on, on that particular technology, Elaine? Is, is facial recognition technology being used in, in China and in fact anywhere else around the world for, for similar ends? Yeah, I mean, facial recognition technology is a huge part of it. It's part of building that, you know, data map of Uyghurs. And, you know, it's not just China that is doing this. I mean, we actually put out a piece last week about how the Israeli government, you know, likewise is building a database of personal information of Palestinians. And so they have this app that they use. It's called the, I think it's called the Blue Wolf um, app. And they will scan a Palestinian face at a checkpoint and it will go red, yellow, or green to say whether or not the person can pass. And that is based on personal information, photos, family history, stuff that's been scraped from the internet. Um, and it basically assigns them a security rating. So, you know, I think this is really dangerous that we have these surveillance technologies that are available and that are being, you know, exported, quite frankly, to other countries and being used in a way to target um, anyone that the government doesn't like. Mm. It's a massive industry, right, Elaine? It's a multi-billion dollar industry biometrics. And, you know, there's a, an analysis that borders are going to be the place in which a lot of this technology is developed and experimented on. And that particularly as we move into a phase of human civilization where we're facing pretty serious consequences from catastrophic climate change, people will be on the move. And you can see how this might be able to be deployed in that context too. But Plenty of companies are making a lot of money from selling this kind of technology 
to states that use it in very oppressive ways. And I think that's the other part of it that's really important to remember. And it's interesting, one of the arguments that's being waged against Australia placing um, safeguards in the development AI and, the, and, and, and facial recognition technology is kind of, we lose some sort of competitive advantage with the rest of the world if we don't go down this track, right? Um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, you go. I, well, I don't, I, yeah, I mean, I, I worry that it becomes like then this race to the bottom on, mm. you know, sale and transfer of surveillance technology. I mean, certainly we would like a moratorium on, you know, some of these technologies being used unless there are adequate safeguards in place. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting to see, I think it was just uh, a, a few weeks back. So there's been a lot of talk about Pegasus. I don't know if you've talked about that, you know, on this show, but, um, you know, it's this um, spyware that basically can be used and has been used to spy on activists and, and journalists and lots of different governments have been using it, including the Indian government. Um, and the US has actually just, you know, recently blacklisted NSO Group, which is the Israeli um, company that, you know, makes Pegasus. And yeah, I think, you know, if, we, if we're looking at, you know, malicious, um, cyber activity. I mean, it was just uh, yesterday that the government passed new grounds for targeted sanctions on, you know, foreign individuals and entities. Then I think we also need to look at, you know, where this kind of technology is being used in malicious ways to spy on activists. You know, I, I also think there should be actions taken against those entities. You certainly shouldn't be allowing them to, you know, sell their, yeah, sell their gear here and, and use it in Australia. Just picking up on that point then, Alain, and perhaps going back to where we started, I mean, I know that Human Rights Watch is looks at these things on a global basis, but what do you think the lessons are for Australia? We're obviously seeing some really concerning developments, which we've obviously gone through over the last 15 minutes or so happening around the world. Uh, are, there, are there things that Australia should be doing now, do you think, to mitigate the risk of, of similar things taking, taking hold here? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think governments do need to set rules around surveillance, and I think they do need to oblige companies to, to follow those rules. And so, you know, one thing, is, as I just mentioned, would be, you know, having a moratorium on surveillance technology that is being used to commit serious human rights abuses and sanctioning uh, the companies that, you know, use that, that sell and profit in technology that is used uh, for those purposes. I think that's something that you know, the Australian government could do. And I think, you know, there is a lot of talk now about, you know, what are the adequate safeguards in place? But I think, you know, there's also a danger sometimes, like we were talking about that, you know, the, the trolling legislation. I mean, we've also seen, you know, sometimes governments see, oh, okay, if, you know, the Australian government is introducing, you know, certain legislation to make it easier to sue people online. You know, I, I worry that then, you know, the Indonesias and the Vietnams and the others will say, well, you know, see, Australia's got this technology to make it easier to, to sue people who are saying things that are uncomfortable. You know, we'll, we'll also adopt, they, you know, cyber laws that make it easier um, to, to criminalise speech that, that they don't like and almost use it as a justification. So I think that's why it's really important that, yeah, democracies like Australia and the US and the UK actually take, you know, a very strong position on these things and don't let things creep in just to make it, you know, easier for rich and powerful people to, to sue other people. There was an interesting observation at our launch on Wednesday night, which we'll probably put up as a burning platforms over the summer from Nicholas Davis, who's really smart Australian guy who's come back from a decade at the World Economic Forum and uh, contributed to the book of essays as well. But he, he made the point that we often think about the way we approach technology, the platforms as either regulation or not regulation. And he his observation was there is one model where governments regulate the platforms and another model where governments empower citizens to have rights um, in a digital space. And that seems to be an interesting way of changing the way we look at some of this and probably one that you know I, I, I will um, reflect over as we as we go back over this discussion as well. Which is, which is, I think, brings us back to what Lizzie touched on before as well, which is one of the places they could start is with privacy rights and mm. with actually implementing some regulation, uh, which is underway. I mean, in fairness, there is a, yeah. there is a discussion paper live at the moment with a ridiculous deadline for submission. But it does, but go, point. Uh, it does go to the choices and the priorities of the government. So they've moved really hard on the news media bargaining code and they've moved really hard on the DEFO, which is basically both promoting interest of ex particular interest, but what's sitting there waiting for action 
is reform of privacy, the um, human rights and technology paper from Ed Santo. So this, it's almost like the choices the government's making as well is a bit of a tell, right? Are you suggesting that they're only choosing the things that the media companies will support, Peter? I think it gives it a bit of momentum, doesn't it? <laughs> so just because um, privacy actually targets the business model, like their business model is engagement because it allows them to have eyeballs for advertising, you know, and mm. that I think is where privacy is so important, you know. Um, uh, I just think that, that if we're actually going to talk about regulation that targets the excesses of the business model and stops them, you know, working for shareholder value at the expense of everything else, that is the where we should be looking. So it's just a bit tiresome for me to be the person that has to say that. But anyway, this is what I like about this platform because we do have disagreements and they're very civil and this is a model for other online spaces. So it's very nice to have Elaine as a coalition against YouTube, but um, I'm also <laughs> appreciative yes, that you're, you're very good humoured, yeah. you're good humoured about uh, this disagreement because I think it, it is it is useful and these points don't have don't all have easy answers by any stretch. I, I don't right. think we're that far apart on privacy, by the That's way. That's what you always say, Dan. That's what you always say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to bring in um, um, someone who's probably going to support you then in the couple minutes we've got left. Do you, do you have a thought, Elaine, on, on privacy? Does Human Rights Watch, have you done any thinking around um, the implications of privacy reform on, on human rights? Yeah, I mean, I, have, I must admit, we haven't really looked at those issues here in Australia, but, you know, I think it, it, it's really important because, I mean, we, you know, I was talking before about Xinjiang and how the absence of privacy is really sort of modifying people's um, behaviour, you know, in in real life in, in Xinjiang. Um, but, you know, I also, earlier this year, I interviewed um, this Harvard professor, Shoshana Zuboff, about her book, uh, Surveillance Capitalism. And, you know, that was fascinating, actually, because that was like how, you know, it's actually not the state in the, in the US or in Australia, but it's actually the companies that are still collecting these vast amounts of your personal information. And to what end? In order to modify your behaviour so that you go into that certain shop, so that you buy, you know, a coffee at a certain cafe. Um, and I also find that extremely worrying. So I think we do need to have, you know, very important safeguards for privacy, for anonymity. Um, and I think we just need to be very clear that the measures that are taken, you know, really are necessary um, and proportionate. Um, because otherwise I really worry that we end up with a situation, you know, of, of massive overreach. I think that surveillance capitalism, that book has been referenced about maybe 135 times in, in no, this little actually, book that, that Peter's just put out. <laughs> hey, um, one final um, ad. So if you are Melbourne based, we are going to do a Melbourne launch at the Vic Trades Hall on Tuesday, December 14. We'll um, send an invite to this list if any of you want to come along. Lizzie and myself, Dan's stuck in Perth, so he's, he's off the off the team for this one, um, but with um, Mark Andreevich and Belinda Barnett, who are both contributors as well. Depending on the vibe, we might just drink, we might do a burning platforms. We'll see how it goes, Lizzie. But um, Might do both. Yeah, at the same time. But um, thanks for your time today. Have you got anything else on, on the on the um, diary for Digital Rights Watch over the next couple of weeks? Yeah, I just posted a, a link in there. We've got our last event on rebalancing the digital economy. Um, it's called Gather. You can register. It's um, on the 9th of December. And this is the last of the four-part um, set of events. It's about movement building and political organisation. So on, in online spaces, we'd love you to come if you want to talk about that. Excellent. Um, and this is the last of these for the year. Um, like I say, we might put a couple of recordings of some of the events we've been doing out over summer, but thanks for your support guys over the last year. It's been really good fun as we've sort of turned this in from a bit of a, I don't know, I don't know what we've turned it into, but it feels like it's getting a little bit more definition as we go. And it's been fantastic having you both along for the ride. Thanks for your time today, Elaine. Um, and enjoy your Christmas parties. I'm the only one missing out. I'm driving the mudgie. <laughs> Definitely not a party. That's not a Both party. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, folks. Thanks.